Good morning. This is Doug Drake with The Edge. I'd like to um, thank you for joining our webinar this morning on data analytics for GMPK. Um, the Edge has an extensive collection of templates and protocols that we'll illustrate for both in vivo and vitro GMPK and ADME. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Andrew Lemon, the CEO and President of The Edge, to do the presentation and also demonstration. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. So, yeah, in today's um, webinar, we're going to be focusing on our solutions for DMPK, and particularly the data analytics aspects. So this is how to uh, analyze data from a variety of different DMPK assays uh, and generate high-quality reports and results. I'm going to be reviewing the challenges involved um, as well as some of our solutions to these issues. Before we start, a little bit about The Edge. Um, we're an independent company. We're over 10 years in business, and we're domain experts in the area of pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical research. Our software is used by um, at least four of the top 10 pharmaceutical companies, and we have customers ranging from the west coast of the US all the way through to uh, uh, Shanghai and Japan in the east. We deliver solutions that are uh, for biologists, which are focused on providing support for things like assay requesting and planning, data management in areas like DMPK, ADME, in vivo and in vitro scientists, uh, sciences in both pharmaceutical and biopharmaceutical research areas, compound management with support for ordering and inventory. If there's one thing we're passionate about, it's helping you to optimize your processes whilst keeping the value of your data. And you'll see this as a theme in every webinar that we produce. So the objectives of today's uh, webinar is to focus on the needs of DMPK around data analytics. We're going to review some of the challenges, look at our solutions, and then we'll show you the system in action. And finally, review the benefits with you and take your questions at the end. So a little bit about some of the challenges specifically of dealing with areas like DMPK. Uh, obviously, DMPK covers a variety of different assays, both in vitro and in vivo. And these require a software solution which is, contains uh, enough flexibility that it can cope with the variability, uh, flexibility, and workflow requirements of these types of assays. Of course, also, we want to be able to accommodate the reporting requirements, and finally, make sure that we can s capture structured information and exploit that data for the betterment of your science and your projects. So a little bit about the types of diversity in those assays, particularly in the DMPK space. So here we've got an example set of areas where we're providing data analytics into, so areas like permeability, uh, in vivo PK, stability assays, binding assays, clearance assays, those sorts of uh, assays. So covering both in vitro and in vivo work. Also looking at areas like transport assays, uh, interaction assays, and many other types. Many different types of methods are used, both different analytical methods and also different experimental procedures. Again, between uh, contrast between in vitro assays and in vivo assays. And of course, they also have changing needs over time. The data can be very variable as well. Uh, for example, we might have different mass spectrometers generating different types of file output. There's an example underneath here, which can have variable structures to them uh, in various different formats. <clears throat> they can vary both in terms of the content of the files themselves and also in the format that the data is in as well. Other areas of uh, variability might be in uh, the type of analysis plate that's being uh, processed, uh, both in terms of the number of wells, its layout, and other things that are involved uh, in the, the analysis of the data. So we need a software system that can cope with variability. It also needs to be flexible when it's dealing with the number of samples, the plate and format and plate layout. Uh, the number of different species and different condition sets that are being used uh, in various different runs of an assay. We need a software system that will allow us to bring 
cope with these different areas of flexibility and still work no matter what happens in terms of conditions. And here's a particular example. Uh, we might want to calculate the scaled clearance, for example, in, in an assay. And that will depend on the conditions that are run. So the scaling factors uh, might vary according to which species we're using. Uh, for many of our contract research customers, it's not only variability according to the uh, species, but also which customer, because different customers might want different scaling factors. So the software is flexible enough to be able to automatically look up the correct scaling factors to match both the sample source and also the species. It also needs to be able to cope with a variety of different workflows. So here's an example workflow where we're receiving samples to test. We're tracking the inventory that's required. That's where the samples are and how much of them there is. And then we're going to efficiency, efficiently process a set of working lists for different people in order to get the study done. And that will involve interaction with other teams. So it might be uh, that we need to source animals for an in vivo uh, study, for a PK study. Or we might need to source a formulation of compound from a different group. And then once the uh, samples are collected, we'll need to interact perhaps with a bioanalysis group that can analyze those samples and bring the data together. So this leads to the requirement to be able to accommodate different lab workflows. So preparing plates maybe incubating the microsome sort of on the plate, adding the compound, and then sampling the wells at different time points, quenching the, uh, quenching the samples, and then of course going through the analysis process, so finally ending up with our, our results that are available for the, for the study. Once you've analyzed your data and captured it, of course we also need to be able to generate reports. So, and reporting requires, again, a lot of flexibility selecting the right data, uh, whether it comes from a particular client, if you're a contract research organization, or the project for a particular customer, uh, sorry, a particular project if you're uh, working in a pharmaceutical company. We also need to make sure we're selecting the right data across the right timelines as well. So if we're looking to evaluate results across a particular, uh, the last month of a study, then we need to actually be able to select the right timelines as well and also generate that data in the correct format. And this is particularly acute for our contract research organization customers, where they may have multiple clients that all would like subtly different ways of presenting the results. And if we've got one system that can only produce one type of output, it's not flexible enough to deliver those. They would end up having to re reformat that data involving manual processes for each client, which is very time consuming and also could introduce errors. Um, so we need to make sure we've got the right data and the right reports, and we can generate that data both as data itself that can be transferred to other systems, and also as reports with your annotation and interpretation of the data. That's particularly acute into areas like uh, more expert studies in areas like transporters or in areas like uh, uh, in vivo PK, where it's important that the scientist uh, provides their annotation and interpretation of the data as well as the raw data itself. Of course, once we've captured our data, we also want a system that's uh, uh, able to exploit the data. So this could be in terms of uh, checking for quality control, so introducing more advanced quality controls, such as statistical tests, uh, tests that are related to fitting constraints used, and also maybe related to the range of data collected. We also want to be able to exploit that data in terms of uh, historical performance of things like standards. So be able to query across the historic results for a standard against the same condition sets, and then evaluate its statistical variance to make sure that uh, the current experiment is within statistical variation. And of course, also, we don't want to be able to do cross-study trending and analysis, which is kind of the holy grail, particularly in in vivo science, but also other areas as well. And all of these things lead to the requirement to be able to store not just information and documents, but actually to store structured data and make that available for, for exploitation. 
So what's the solution to these, these challenges? We need a system uh, that's capable of doing anal uh, of providing an analytical data environment. Uh, it needs to manage the dimensionality of the data, so it expands to meet the conditions that you're running it under, whether that be a variable plate size or uh, treatment group sizes or number of animals or, or other observables. It needs to have all the analytics capabilities that you need, so uh, things like curve fitting for calculating IC50, EC50s, um, statistical analysis uh, to, to measure the statistical validity of data and also things like PK modeling so for in vivo PK so we can calculate areas under the curves and, and clearances and things. We also want to be able to provide an electronic protocol which helps the user to guide their way through the process to reduce the number of operator errors and also cut out all of those copy and paste operations and data manipulations that often lead to, you know, when we run a process over many, many, many manual uh, repetitions, they often lead to small mistakes, which are, which are well, not so difficult to spot, but take a lot of time to check and, uh, and uh, val validate that the data is correct. So what we've provided is a set of what we call elastic templates that will expand to meet the needs of your data. So they can cope with groups and subgroupings, they can cope with relationships between data as well. So you can relate the data captured in one set of, uh, of tables and sheets to the data recorded in other ones in order to analyze and, and establish relationships in that data. What it means is you can model the data and also the calculations. So if it's model based, that means you can apply the same calculations no matter what the conditions are. So even if we change the plate format or we we vary the uh, number of microsomes or which species are being tested. Well, the, an the analysis templates will still work the same. It also understands your scientific data types and data files. So it's able to read things like mass spectrometry files, read a files from fluorescence instruments and other parts of data and interpret that without you having to do a lot of pre-processing. As I mentioned, it's got <laughs> built-in analytics capabilities. So you can do curve fits for things like uh, IC50 determinations and clearances uh, can be done using the area of the curve calculations. You can graph the data with interactive graphs that you can, you can uh, knock out data points or manipulate the data as you need to do that. And also present statistics in a variety of different ways to make sure that the uh, the data is mi uh, statistically meaningful and uh, and validated. It's all instruction driven, so that makes it easier for people to use. So lowers the training requirements. It also helps them to establish a repeatable and reliable way of operating uh, their standard operating procedures, because all they need to do is work through the instructions, as you can see here. So it's a case of clicking through the instructions. It will guide you through the process of gathering and analyzing your data. And that makes it easy to learn. Uh, it's provided with a, a series of flexible deployment options. So uh, we have the enterprise system BioRails that works alongside these analytics capabilities. Um, that will allow you to request and schedule studies and then execute them. Uh, it provides a set of extensive web services for data access and also lots of integration options. So again, we can avoid these copy and paste operations. So we can source data from your registration system to look up samples and make sure they're correct. We can import data from instruments and uh, readers, and we can also export data back into other systems for use. For uh, compliant environments, uh, GLP, we have a partnership with Biovia, where the same analytics capabilities are available in their electronic lab notebook environment. So it's basically available at the desktop as a personal productivity tool, as a part of an enterprise workflow system, or as part of a compliant electronic lab notebook environment. And all that helps you to store, protect, and exploit the data. And BioRails provides the structured data storage that backs up this analytics capabilities. 
it allows you to record and exploit the data with all its dimensionality. And that's really important. That means that you can search data, find the correct results that match the conditions that you're looking for. You can aggregate data across multiple studies if you want to do that. And then, of course, report it as needed. So that might be a report, a client-specific report, that you're generating data for a specific client. Or it might be project-related data that you're generating for a project done internally. It also helps you to manage the knowledge that's generated during these studies. So it's not just like a LIMS where it's storing data. It also allows you to write up and interpret the data. And then, of course, record and protect the intellectual property associated with that interpretation. The whole system's been designed for biologists and for their collaborators. So it covers the full workflow. So from study requests through the planning aspects, right through the data analytics, and then finally the publication of results and sharing them back with project teams or customers. At this point, I'm going to hand over to uh, Peter Vine, who's our senior consultant and data scientist. So today you've got a truly international uh, uh, team here. I've, I'm here in the UK, uh, where our headquarters are. Uh, Doug is our business development uh, representative over in the US. And now I'm going to introduce you to Peter, our senior consultant, a data scientist who's based in the Netherlands. And he's going to take you through a couple of examples uh, of using this technology to analyze and, and generate data. Uh, right. What I'm going to show you today is exactly what, uh, what Andrew has, uh, has introduced. So the focus of today's session is uh, on MORFIT, on the data processing, uh, so through the eyes of the end user, and also on quality control. So the, uh, we, we did deliver a couple of similar binders already, and that was all doing the data processing. But uh, we are now integrating the whole quality control as well. So if you've never seen MORFIT, I will give you a very brief introduction. It, it behaves like a spreadsheet, but it's got all the uh, advantages of a database environment. So all the data is uh, organized in tables like you're used to in Excel. You've got workbooks here on the right. So the document, the support, the acquire, you can give them names. Uh, we do that, of course. These binders are ready to go, ready for you to use. And in each workbook, you find these tables. But you, you don't need to know because everything is driven here from the instructions on the left. And basically, you only do this in chronological order. So you type import data in this case. Then you move on to the analysis. Then you get to the conclusions of your study. And then you upload all your results uh, to the database that you are connected to. All our binders that we build start with a screen like this, where it lands on the landing page, where you can briefly see the purpose and the version of this particular uh, binder, as we call it. This is a MORFIT application. So let's uh, just have a go and press this button, Import Data. What we are currently doing is uh, bringing mass, spec mass spectrometry data uh, sitting on a CSV file into this binder. So I click this link, and it brings it opens a dialog box uh, on my file system. And I can then open one or multiple files. So I will just open those four. Uh, it doesn't matter. It can even cope with 20 or 200 files in one go. So I will just click the button, and now it's importing the data. And it's also processing all the data in one go. The first view that you're going to get is a view of the data that sits inside these MS files. And uh, it shows it as a MORFIT table, so you can just briefly have, have a look at it. But it's not that interesting. It's just to show you that it's, it's read all these records from the file. So here you see, by the way, the file name number one. So this is the, the full path name that I opened with all the records in it. And then uh, here is the second, and so on. So then I quickly move on to the analysis part. And everything from this file is organized in a, a very usable way. So it has picked up that we are testing these samples, which sits in the, in the highest. This is a hierarchical table where we, we have all these conditions. So these are your con experimental conditions. Your, it starts with a sample. 
then it found that it, it is measuring in the files it has found uh, for this particular sample several species, in this case human and rat as a species, and per species it also has found uh, these matrices. So the plasma is found for the human species, and for the rat it has found the lung and the plasma. So you see uh, that it is quite, quite well organized. You get this uh, children of parents thing. It's a hierarchical table. So it, it just, there's more and more records being filled here. Then it moves on to find the concentrations. So the lung is standard measured at, at five. It can also fill in the defaults for you. So if you always are going to measure plasma in the red at 0 0.5 concentration, uh, then uh, it will fill it out for you automatically. But of course you can also specify it in the file that you're recording. Uh, then it found also the number of replicates in the file and it automatically scales the table to it. So if it, it is finding only one replicate, there will just be this one, one thing. And then per replicate it found the buffer, the matrix and the time zero uh, concentration. And it needs these three per replicate to work out the free and the bound percent concentration. So that is what it's doing here. So now it works its way up again. So here you get more and more records, so three data fields. And then it combines, it merges it into this single data field. And then if you move to the right, it does all sorts of quality checks. So here you see these four important columns. And as you can see, these are tick boxes, but you can't tick them yourself. They are written by the system according to predetermined rules. So uh, first, it will try to find whether this condition set is a standard in the essay. And if we scroll down, there is one standard found. So that's clozapine. So the system has detected that this particular sample is clozapine and that under the red lung conditions, uh, it is used as a standard in this particular essay. Then what it immediately does, and that's not visible uh, uh, because it's fully automated, it will go to the database, it will pick up the last three or six months, whatever you want to, to have, uh, historic data from the database under this similar experimental conditions, and it checks whether the current free uh, fraction is in the right range. So that in this case, we have set it up to be in the range of minus two to plus two standard deviation, which is, which is uh, pretty uh, common in, in analytical labs. So uh, whenever it finds that the free fraction is in that range, it ticks this box. So it says, okay, this quality check uh, can be ticked. Then it also does a statistical test. So this second tick box, is checking whether the, the responses in the buffer are different from zero. And it uses uh, a t-test for this. Uh, so it, it's got a number of blanks. It's also got a number of buffers. And you want to be sure that the system is uh, sensitive enough to pick up the compound, basically. And that is what, what is ticked here. So that is all done by the binder, fully automatic. And then there is a third check whether the internal standards are OK. So uh, per plate, it also has a couple of internal standards, and it just works out, again, with uh, uh, thresholds if the internal standard on the plate is okay. And then, in this case, that's, that's true. So all the three constraints have been ticked. And here, uh, that is just, you can, you can hide that or you can keep it visible. It's also giving you some numerical feedback of the coefficient of variation of your internal standards during this, on this plate. Uh, so then I, I, I said to you that this is all set automatically according to predefined rules. But now comes the nice thing. Often uh, you also want to have manual control. So the combined three quality checks are then brought into this inclusion or what how we call it include tick box and that is under manual control. So all three constraints have been fulfilled. And now, so the, the, automatically the data is passed, and that means the field is green and ticked. But I can manually exclude it. If I still find a good reason that I don't want this data to be passed, then I just tick that box. And as you see, 
an automatic comment is being generated that I have manually excluded this data. And uh, of course, this is on the, uh, on the level of the results themselves. But in case you also want to, uh, uh, to knock out one replicate, then you can do that as well. So you can just go here and then press Control K or use this icon, the knockout, and then it automatically uh, changes the, the calculations to, so that did, this replicate is no longer used in the, in the computations. So if we then go to the right, it will do the averaging uh, of across all the three replicates. So here we've got the free fraction of the replicates and based on the inclusion, it will then decide, okay, the response at time zero, the free fraction, the standard deviation of the free fraction, the number of replicates included, and all of that is being recorded here. Then, of course, you get the corrected. So this is corrected for, for the dilution uh, uh, and the recovered uh, part of your drug. So 87% of, of the drug is, is recovered. With the and everything goes with the standard deviation and the N, and that will also be written to the database. So then we can proceed to the next step. Uh, but not after I've also shown you that you can easily filter this. So all of these boxes have uh, default filters on them. So if I just want to zoom in on, for instance, this sample, I can do that. So in one go, I get all the results. And in this case, it's not such a, a big data set. But if you've got thousands of rows, uh, then it's nice, of course, to have this filtering. We can also focus in on one uh, matrix, for instance, I just want to see plasma matrices and just have a, a quick inspect. So this also helps in, uh, in interacting with your, your, your own data. And, uh, and in this case, uh, I only show a tab, the data in a tabular format, but if uh, there is a need, we can also graphically uh, uh, plot mini graphs inside of these cells. Um, just to show you that in the, uh, in the background it has done the standard. So here you see all the historic data coming from the database on the free fraction for these combination, this combination of sample, species, matrix, dilution and concentration. So this is your historic data set. Uh, if it has found multiple standards, you, this will just automatically expand again. It, uh, more of it is a dimensional spreadsheet. And here it will just plot these historical data in. So this is time versus percentage of, of the free fraction. And here you see there's quite some variation in this case. Here you see in yellow the newly, the newly measured uh, data point just coming in from this experiment together with the standard deviation of the blue data points. So you see that it is just within that range and then the, uh, that is the reason that that tick box was, uh, was filled. So this is just for inspection purposes again. And you can see that uh, these values are coming from the database. Then we move on to the conclusions. If you press that button, you will get the similar table, but now nicely condensed. So you get all your species, samples, matrices, and so forth, but without all the individual data, but just a brief tabular view of all your end results. And if you're happy with that, uh, or not, uh, let me scroll to the right. You also get a flag, so this is valid, and the role, so this is a stand detected as a standard, and this is detected as a standard, and that will also be written to the database with any comments you might have added. Uh, I might have missed that. Let me go back to the analysis. Uh, we've also provided you with uh, the automatic gener generated comment, as as I showed, uh, but I, I can also add some user comments here. So this is uh, accepted, for instance, which makes no, no sense at all to write that here, but just as a, and that will then be concatenated to uh, the string as it will be written to the database, as you see. So you get automatic exclusion reasons plus the uh, manual, manually entered command. And that will be written to the database, uh, so you can't uh, bypass that. Uh, there will always be a record of what was done to the data and whether you have decided to manually include or exclude it. Uh, so that finishes my demo of the first binder. 
but just to show you that we currently make a, a big effort to make all the DMPK assays uh, this have the same look and feel, I will proceed to another binder. I just give you another example. This is an interaction binder where we are uh, looking at the cytochrome P450 inhibition. So we are extracting uh, IC50s for all the uh, different isoforms on, uh, th that are expressed on, on, on the assay. Uh, right, so it is, it's got the, the similar set of instructions. So we start by importing data. So we, we go to our interaction data, generic interaction. And here we, it finds one data file. I will just bring it in. And then it will very briefly show it to you. It takes slightly longer because this is kind of a big data set. Uh, it not only contains lots of samples and standards, but it also contains all the probes and the isoforms, several probes per isoform in the same, in one and the same file. So here is your raw data file again. We, we will skip that. We believe that that's okay. And then we move on to the analysis. And here you have it. And as you see, it looks very, very similar to the previous binder. But this is a more, uh, a more complex binder. So there are more conditions here. It starts with the file again. Then it starts with the sample. Fuvoxamine is a standard, so it should be picked up as a standard. Let's briefly scroll to the right. And indeed, uh, no, it's not. This is detected as a standard. So it is fluvoxamine in this particular combination with this probe, for instance, the finacid. You see that uh, you get the, the probe specific, uh, is specific for the isoform, although you can have multiple probes per isoform. We also have space to uh, record the cofactor, if you, if you happen to have that, the species, the matrix. So it will just, uh, like in the binding case, it will just automatically detect and, and make that, uh, turn that into a hierarchical table. So as you see, you also get curve fits on here because we, we try to extract IC50. So if we scroll down, you see multiple replicates of it. And here you see, see a test compound uh, that might have some inhibition here. So uh, again, um, there are quite some rules to be obeyed. Uh, and in this case, we have said, OK, detect it as a standard. If not, then it's a test compound, obviously. If the standard is OK, there is no need to test that. So the internal standard, is that OK? Yeah, fulfilled. And it also uh, tests whether the slope value is negative. You can have, of course, that your curve fit is going up. And then we have said, OK, suppress that. So you can also have automatic rules, constraint rules, on your fit. And that can, uh, that can be an R squared threshold value. It can be constraints on your parameters and all that. So after it is done the fit, you can decide, OK, do I go for the automatic inclusion or do I want to override? If you select to manually exclude it, you see that the fit is disappearing and the parameters are no longer extracted. So here you see that you get the, uh, the log IC50, the SD and the N, the hill slope, the SD and the N, the minimum, and the maximum. So this is the four parameter logistic equation, the sigmoidal fit applied to these data. And like in the other binder, all these end results are then nicely presented in the conclusions. And here you get uh, in a very condensed view all the uh, samples that you've tested uh, across these various isotypes with these probes and then uh, with your four parameters mentioned here. And again, uh, your command will be included here. So the fit failed to meet criteria. That is an automatically generated uh, command that will be pumped to the database. So I hope that I've uh, shown you a little bit on how we work these days. We try to uh, make a collection of binders called the DMPK package that all are easy to, to drive. So they all work in a similar way. It means that if you have managed and mastered to drive one binder, you can drive them all. And no matter whether there is a fit used or just a tabular, uh, just one table of data or statistical test, it will, uh, we, we, we will try to give you the same look and feel 
across these binders and that is for the everyday routine work of course uh, what you expect and what you want. Uh, so this finishes the demonstration of my second binder but we have many more. So hopefully that will give you an example of a couple of, um, uh, of the different assays that we support. Um, in previous uh, webinars we've shown you some other examples of well such as microsome stability. We also showed the full um, study workflow from study request right through the data analysis and finally the reporting piece as well. So if you're interested in finding out more about some of the other um, assays supported by this system, I will refer you back to um, the previous uh, webinars that are available and recorded uh, on our website. So thank you, Peter. So just a bit of a review of what you've seen. Um, I want to emphasize this this collection of uh, of supported assays. Uh, they've been prepared by us using our own technology. That same technology is available for you to address either variations in those assays. So if you've got particularly variations, you can adjust the the uh, the assay support in those to to accommodate your analytics. So maybe you need less data than we're preparing, or you might want to add some extra calculations. You can easily do that and modify these. You may also have an assay type that we're not even doing um, that's special to you. And again, you can prepare these assay templates um, fairly straightforwardly to address those different types of assays. But here what we're doing is this is a particular collection of pre-prepared um, assays. They're fully documented, so they come with documentation that explains not only how to use them, uh, it, they explain how to adapt the importers to your specific file formats and also explains the design and how to modify them as well. That means they're clear and understandable and easy to use. They're all workflow driven using the instruction menu as, as Peter demonstrated just then. So that makes them easy to use and also reproducible and reliable. And they've all been scientifically validated. That means they're in use in real laboratories uh, on a day-to-day -day basis for DMPK. Uh, that means we know they're dependable and reliable, so they'll produce the right results again and again uh, as you operate them through the instructions. They've all been standardized to a standardized design. So you'll notice that uh, Peter showed you two examples there, one for uh, a binding assay, which can cope with any type of species, matrix, and other conditions. Um, it uses the same design as the interaction assay that he showed you uh, in the following demonstration. So that means we can implement them in a much shorter time. Uh, they're also much easier to understand. Once you have understand the structure of one, then you can easily transfer it and use it for other assays as well. Because they're all using a consistent design, which makes them easy to learn. They're also very adaptable. Uh, you can easily add new columns or, or modify the calculations to suit your science. Uh, so it's not like a hardwired application, which if it doesn't do what you want, it, you know you have to you can't use it. You're able to modify it uh, and also lock it, of course, down once you're ready with it and deploy it out for your users. You can use it standalone as a desktop tool or integrated with the BioRails platform, which manages the workflow and data. And of course, we have also have the ELN option as well. So there's this flexible deployment options. So who uses this system? Well, we have uh, 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 lots of clients. They range from global pharmaceutical companies, uh, biopharmaceutical companies. And also, it, the system's in use at a number of different contract research organizations, providing both uh, high-value bespoke services around DMPK and also more fee-for-service uh, fee uh, models as well. It allows you to track study requests that are coming from project teams, if you're in a pharmaceutical company, or from business development, or from the end customers, uh, if you're a contract research organization. It allows you to account for the work done. So you can say, I've run this number of studies, or processed this number of samples for this particular client, or this particular project. And also allows you to deliver the results and reports in the specific ways that your customers need whether that be a standardized one for your pharmaceutical company 
or whether it's a client specific set of columns to report from the database uh, so you can generate the data in the right format for exchanging with your your pharmaceutical customers if you're a CRO. The system's flexible enough to meet both your workflow and your data needs. Uh, it's a highly configurable system that we can set up to meet exactly your workflow and data storage requirements. So future plans, we're working on version two of the DMPK collection, which is a collection of Morphit binders and BioRails workflows uh, that has been deployed at a number of uh, different contract research organizations of pharmaceutical customers. And, and the latest version, 2.0, we're building in a lot more of these quality control checks um, to make sure that you can not only process your data into results, but also it'll help you with your quality control checks as you do that. We're also working on in vitro toxicology, so things like HERG and cytotoxicity tests, uh, as well as transporter assays, and also more generic in vivo study examples as well. And of course, we, we can't do any of this work uh, without customers to collaborate with. So if you're interested in working with us, either in the DMPK domain or in areas like uh, in vitro toxicology, transporter assays, or, or the general in vivo pharmacology areas, then please do get in touch with us. We would love to work with you uh, on creating uh, even better support for those particular assays and the science involved. I'll also refer you to our website which is www.edge-ka.com, uh, where you can download Morphit itself with a trial version. There are also demonstration videos. There are recordings of previous webinars. There are also white papers in there, and of course, product information, uh, which will allow you to, to, to understand more about our products. And of course, you can always contact us on info at edgeka.com, or uh, we also have a YouTube channel and other social media.